Welcome everyone to our Tuesday morning Bible reading. The theme for this week, indeed the theme for all three weeks of this year's Keswick Convention is grateful, exploring what it means to live a life of gratitude that flows from following Jesus. We're seeking the blessing of God's Spirit, serving God's Word to God's people in Jesus Christ throughout this convention and across this week. Whether you're here with us in the tent, whether you're watching at one of the relay venues around the town, or you're someone who's joining us online from all around the world, we welcome you and it's good to be gathered here with you. Can I encourage you to connect with us via social media? Please use hashtag KESConf22 or tag us in your photos and videos via at Keswick Ministries. As we turn to begin our meeting before we sing, let's bow our heads and I'll pray for our time together. Father in heaven, thank you that you draw near to us by your spirit. We give you thanks and praise that the heavenly realms are burst wide open because of the work of your son, Jesus. Thank you that he sits at your right hand, that he prays and intercedes for his people. Thank you that his work is done, and we look with hope for the blessings of this day and also the blessings to come when he returns. Please help us as we sing and as we listen and as we pray to be those who are drawn near to you with gratitude and rejoicing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. As we stand... 
Listen to these words we heard yesterday. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be adopted, uh, to be predestined to adopt in for sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. Let's praise him together. Praise and glorify. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poured. For pure and blameless in his sight he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his son eternally to the praise of your glory to the praise of your mercy and grace to the praise of your glory you are the God who saves come praise and glorify our God who gives his grace in Christ in him our sins are washed away redeemed through sacrifice in him God has known to us the mystery of his will that Christ should be the head of all his purpose to do take your seats. There are many and varied ways in which to enjoy this convention week. Let me highlight a few of them for us now. First of all, a reminder for mission workers on leave. There's a time for encouragement and sharing for you today, Tuesday afternoon, 2.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon over in the pencil factory in room 22. Childcare is available, and please do sign up for that event at the reception. Tonight, for all of us, after the evening meeting here in the tent, there's going to be a concert with David Lyon, Yvonne Lyon, and Gareth Davis-Jones, bringing songs from their new collaborative album, Trace the Line. So stay on here in the tent, or come and join us here in the tent after the main evening celebration, 9.15 for that concert together. 
Another event for mission people on leave, this time for families, a mission families reception. Tomorrow, it's an event, a chance to chat and connect with others who have loved ones serving God around the world. So tomorrow, Wednesday afternoon, 2.30 to 4 o'clock, again over in the pencil factory, room 22, please do sign up again at the convention reception. Looking ahead to tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning, there's no morning seminars in our 9.30 slot. They start again on Thursday. But tomorrow, we can all come together to hear Chris Kandaya talking about the Daniel calling, positive engagement in the public sphere. Chris will be helping us see how we can be Christians in the wider world, faithfully and with confidence. So come here early tomorrow morning, 9.30, for the uh, Keswick Lecture. Where are you going to spend the rest of the time over your time here in Keswick? Well, we've got a fantastic mission exhibition base camp happening all week over in the packing hall. Our exhibitors, they're many and varied. They'd love to chat with you about what they do and their heart for God's mission in the world. So please do go and visit the stands and see how you could be praying for mission, how you could give, and even perhaps how you could go. They're open every day and would love to see you there. And now, morning wouldn't be complete without some advice on what to read and how to grow in our faith. So, Jonathan, over to you. Thanks very much. Morning, everybody. Now then, I'm going to say something that some of you might find controversial, okay? So brace yourself. If somebody on your row has just sat up and is starting to pay attention, they're probably a Keswick trustee, so look out for them. But um, here's the thing. Okay, hands up if you um, had bought and read Gentle and Lowly. By Dan Orland, okay? Good chunk of you. Hands up, keep them up if you, if you enjoyed it and thought it was one of the best books you've read for a long time. All right, here's the controversial bit for you guys, okay? The book I'm about to recommend is better than that book, okay? It really is. And it's a follow-up uh, by Dane Ortland, following on from Gentle and Lowly. You don't have to have read Gentle and Lowly first, but it, it might be helpful. Uh, but it's his book, Deeper. Uh, which, following on from Gentle and Lowly, really looks to apply some of the truths that he was teaching us in Gentle and Lowly about God's character. And I think this is superb because as he takes that teaching, he then shows us how it is that we can fall in love deeper with the Lord Jesus and then how it changes our life. It's a book about sanctification, really, and, and how each day we can be uh, walking closer uh, with the Lord. I would love you, I, I mentioned just a quote the other day that you could read. Now, this time, just go and read the whole chapter of chapter four uh, on the embrace of God. That is uh, it's an amazing chapter. And then the following chapter is on the acquittal of our sins. Read those chapters alone if you then want to buy the book, great. But I hope I've not offended you by saying this is better than Gentle and Lowly. I know some people are very precious about that book. Why not get both if you haven't read either of them? And, uh, and then uh, day by day, be looking at how we can walk closer with the Lord. Now, as we turn to our passage this morning in Ephesians, we're going to read of the power that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead being the very same power that we have in each of us today by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I don't know about you, but sometimes you feel, well, where is that power? I seem to fall into the same sins over and over again. I seem to struggle in my Christian life. Change can be hard. I want to encourage you, change can come by that same power. And some of you have been asking us, well, what, what could we be studying perhaps in our own devotions or in a group? So I want to highlight this one. It's called Real Change. It goes through six studies looking again at this is your issue of sanctification, how it is that God uh, it can be changing us day by day. There's leader's notes at the back as well. So if you're working at, through it as a church, then you, you only need to get one resource uh, rather than buying a separate leader's guide. But this would be very helpful as we consider how is it that day by day we can be falling more in love with the Lord Jesus and day by day becoming more and more like him. Thanks. Jonathan, thanks very much indeed. Um, as you've picked up, I hope by now, that Keswick Ministries is more than just the convention. Part of the vision in which the Dome Project is a part is to develop ministries other times of year. So I want to tell you a little bit about three teaching and training courses that are coming up over the coming year. Two of them we ran for the first time this year. Some of you will have been on them. We had fantastic feedback from them. 
The first one is called Leading Well. This is a workshop specifically if you're an elder, an elder or a lay leader in the local church. Too often in church settings, you can feel like you're serving but not being resourced or equipped and empowered. Or you're the, the pastor in a church and you'd love to be able to equip and train. You don't feel you've got quite the skills to do that or whatever. Leading well is to help you in that specific gap if you're an elder or lay leader. Chance to come apart, to meet with others in the same position, to think about what does leadership mean in the Bible context, in the context of the church, what's God's plan for the church? How do I understand the context I find myself in? And then on from that, how do I work best in a team? How can I grow my self-awareness? So it's both biblical and practical. That's called leading well. The leaflets on the stand as you head out. The second course is we've called Faith in the Second Half, or FISH for short. It's in partnership with Faith in Later Life, and it's to help those of us in the second half of our lives, as one of my daughters said to me relatively recently, Dad, did you know with this birthday that you're nearer 90 than 18? (laughs) You can work that out. But it's to help those of us in the second half of our lives or those um, ministering with those in the second half of our lives or caring for those to embrace what that second half of our life means. How can we be empowered and equipped to live for Christ in the second half of our lives? We had a fantastic conference this last year. The videos will be available on YouTube. You can read about it in the recent Evangelicals Now, where there was an article was featured by Roger Carswell on that. And the next year, we're thinking about the whole question of how it could be church for everyone, the kind of across the generations. Because so many of us have got so much to give, and yet we're not always appreciated. And how can we uh, live for Christ in the second half of our lives? And the third course, just to highlight, we've called the Keswick Leadership Course. It was previously called the Influential Leadership Workshop. It's the Keswick Leadership Course. This is for leaders in every sphere of life. So this last one that we did, and I'll say a bit more about it this afternoon, it was an absolute joy and a thrill to have, let me give you four people who came to give you an idea of how broad it can be. One, Ifan, she's one of 20 paediatric palliative care consultants in this country, so helping young children and their families to cope with the death. Amazing to be working with her and equipping her to go into the into the uh, hospital room and to care for people. Our second was Kate. She is a a young entrepreneur of 24. She set up her own business, the 3D printing of prosthetic limbs for kids. And even, I'm not sure I fully understand how that would even work, the 3D printing. But this young businesswoman with a passion to make a difference for Christ. Then we had Jo who came. She's a nurse and officer in the RAF. Her job is to train and equip those in, on the front line to evacuate casualties back to the UK. And our fourth one was a pastor and mission pioneer who's planting churches and involved with European mission. So if you're a church lead in any sphere of life, this is for you. So those are three uh, courses, a great snapshot for you. You can find more about these different courses. I'll talk about these and others this afternoon in the Pencil Factory at 2 o'clock. No need to book. I think it's in 1-3. And as you leave, you get a leaflet here, which will tell you more about the different courses that are on offer. Uh, there's something for everyone. If it's not for you, someone in your church. Thank you. Thank you, James, for telling us about that rich and varied program. I hope that's feeding and helpful over the coming year. I'm now going to be joined on stage by Karen Shaw from All Nations Christian College, who's going to read today's Bible passage for us. Morning, Karen. Morning. You're here this week. You're in charge of base camp over the week. What's been most encouraging for you over these opening few days of this week? It's just been fantastic to see all of you guys coming and talking to the exhibitors and seeing how you can get involved in mission, be it giving, praying or going. Wonderful. Well, thank you for bringing our reading to us. I'm just going to pray for Jeremy and for us before we do so, and then I'll hand over to you. Let's bow our heads and pray. 
Father in heaven, thank you that we can open our Bibles physically before us. Thank you for those who've translated them, for the freedom that's given to us to do this. We pray for those watching on, online, perhaps in more constrained situations. Please, for them and for us, please open your word to us. Feed us. Please give us the sweetness, the riches, the blessing, the power that is your word. By your spirit, bringing it to us. Please help us to listen well. Please be with Jeremy as he teaches it to us. Please may our hearts be welcoming and good soil for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. For this reason, ever since I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that, the, that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may better know him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, in every name that is invoked, and not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I think I'm going to try that one again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That's better. So lovely to have you with us today. Uh, it's lovely to see the sunshine out. There is still a sun in the sky. Thank you for all of you that have persevered over a wet weekend. And uh, let's get ready to hear God's word now. Um, please do have your Bibles open, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Um, this is Paul's prayer, and uh, I pray with Paul that God will use these words to bless your life today. Now, my boys uh, used to love going to aquariums when we were on holiday, and so we've learned a lot of information about sharks. Did you know that sharks only grow according to the area in which they're allowed to swim? So if you put a shark into a tiny tank when they are young, it's quite possible that the shark will remain tiny for the rest of its life. In fact, it's possible to have a fully grown shark that is only six inches long. That's why the biggest fish tanks in the aquarium are set aside for sharks so that they can reach their full potential. The shark was made to swim in the ocean it wasn't made to paddle in little pools. And if you remove the shark from a tiny tank and you place it into a huge ocean, it will grow to be the mightiest fish in the sea. But whether a shark remains six inches long all its life or whether it grows to be this glorious monster of the sea is all down to the environment in which it swims. If you have limited expectations for a shark to grow, it won't grow. If your expectations are as wide as the ocean, it will flourish and become a magnificent creature. Now, as we look this morning at Paul's beautiful prayer in the second half of Ephesians 1, it's clear how passionate Paul is about the Ephesian Christians growing in their faith. In the first part of chapter 1, Paul has laid out for us a wonderful picture of the gospel, a picture of God choosing us before time began to be adopted as His children through the blood of Christ, a plan that will reach its culmination when God brings everything together under Christ's lordship. 
That is the gospel that has saved us. But Paul doesn't want us to simply paddle in the pool of this gospel, just getting our feet wet. He wants us to wade in the depths of the ocean of the gospel, growing in the gospel like a shark growing in the ocean. And this prayer in verses 15 to 23 is a powerful reminder to us that our conversion to Christ, however long ago that was for you, our conversion is not the end of a journey, it's just the beginning of a journey. It's a journey to grow in our knowledge of God and in our service to God wherever He has placed us. So many Christians experience stunted growth. We are happy to settle for a kind of spiritual mediocrity. In fact, I think there are whole churches who have settled for a lowest common denominator Christianity when real transformation is not even expected. The fish tank is small. But Paul is exhorting us here not to do that. Charles Swindoll wrote the book, Rising Above the Level of Mediocrity. And that's where this prayer takes us this morning. We're going to look at Paul's prayer by asking a series of questions, questions designed to help you analyze whether you truly are growing in the gospel. So the first question is this, are you growing in the fruits of the faith? Are you growing in the fruits of the faith? That's verses 15 and 16 of the prayer. Notice that at the beginning of this prayer, Paul gives thanks for all that God is doing in the lives of these Ephesian Christians. And he hones in on two traits which are key signs of growth in Christ. So verse 15 says, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Faith and love are the two major qualities that Paul looked for in every believer, like a metal detector searching for jewels in the ground. And we know that faith and love are key because Paul mentions them so regularly in his other letters. And you'll probably know that there's a word missing here. Faith, love, and hope. Let me try that one again. Faith, love, and hope. I love this participation thing. We're getting there. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that tongues will cease and prophecies will cease, but these three remain, faith, hope, and love. These are the core attributes of a true disciple. So these are the things we need to be growing in. Now, you might ask, why does Paul only mention faith and love here? Where did hope disappear to? Well, actually, hope hasn't disappeared at all. At the end of the previous passage we looked at yesterday, verse 14, Paul says that the seal of the Holy Spirit guarantees our future inheritance. The Spirit is our first taste and guarantor of future glory. That is our hope. And the longer we walk with Christ, the older we get in Christ, the more the Spirit fills us with the hope of glory. In fact, that's what should be happening in our lives at least. I visited an older couple in my church um, a few months ago, and it seemed that their conversation was just all about the last doctor's appointment, the next doctor's appointment, the medical cabinet, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, making sure you had all all the right pills together. I just thought as I was talking to them, we need to change the conversation here. And I said to them, look, your medical condition really isn't going to change that much. I'm a very encouraging pastor that way. Um but you need to change the conversation because there's something you can do about how you're thinking about your future. It's not all doctor's appointments. You have the hope of glory to look forward to. And so I just wrote out for them a few encouraging passages, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Peter 1, all these passages about our future hope. I said, stop talking about doctors and your latest scan. Look at these passages about the coming again of Christ, about heaven, about the future. Start to analyze those passages, study them, talk about them with each other, change the conversation. 
And I tell you, the next time I went there for a pastoral visit, the conversation was totally different. They were just thrilled with the hope of glory. Their medical condition had not changed, not one bit, but their hearts had changed because they had focused on the hope that is ahead of us. We need to do that. So hope is very much mentioned here, but Paul focuses particularly in this verse on faith and love. Are we growing in faith and love? Now, this word faith, such a key word in Scripture, is obviously linked to what we believe. And what we believe really matters. Doctrine matters. A Unitarian bishop once said, I don't teach doctrine because doctrine divides people. Well, of course doctrine divides people. Doctrine defines what Christianity is and exposes those who are genuine believers and those who are not, so that those who are not genuine believers might come to Christ because it's a life and death issue. But that's precisely why liberals don't emphasize doctrine. But you remember Paul highlighting the importance of doctrine in 1 Corinthians 15, one of the most important passages in the New Testament. Paul says, I passed on to you what I received, which is of first importance. Do you know that not all biblical truth is of equal importance? This is of first importance. What is of first importance? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And Paul was passing on these core doctrinal truths like a Securicor agent passing on huge sums of money. He says, don't mess with these truths. He was saying, if you don't believe that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, you have believed in vain. You cannot possibly be saved if you don't believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. It really matters eternally what you believe. The famous atheist Christopher Hitchens once had a, a rather awkward debate with a liberal minister called Marilyn Sewell. Marilyn Sewell said, the religion you cite in your book, Christopher Hitchens, is generally the fundamentalist faith of various kinds. Isn't it lovely that when people attack evangelicals today, they usually use the word fundamentalist, you fundamentalists. Of course, there's a difference between evangelicalism and fundamentalism. I won't go into it. But that's the question she was asking. She said, I am a liberal Christian, and I don't take the stories from the Scripture literally. I don't believe in the doctrine of atonement. This was a church minister who said this, that Jesus died for our sins, for example, do you make a distinction between fundamentalist faith and liberal religion? And Christopher Hitchens replied, I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and Messiah, and that He rose again from the dead, and by His sacrifice our sins are forgiven, then you're really not in any meaningful sense a Christian. And Marilyn Sewell looked embarrassed. She shuffled her papers and said, let's move on to something else. <laughs> Even atheists like Christopher Hitchens knew that what you believe matters. And part of growing in our faith involves growing in our understanding of sound doctrine, not settling for a superficial understanding of the truths of the faith. And that involves, of course, not just listening to sermons, but reading good Christian books. Kent Hughes, the pastor in America, he, he wrote a book called Disciplines of a Godly Man, and at the end of this book, he noted down, he, he had sent letters around um, prominent Christian leaders around America, asking them, what were the 10 books that had most impacted your ministry and your life? And it was amazing how many of those leaders wrote back, well, I read Knowing God by J.I. Packer, and I read The Cross of Christ by John Stott. Loads of these Christian leaders had read those two core books, and their ministries developed out of books like that. And so I would urge you to go to the bookshop and get stocked up, not just because it keeps Jonathan Carswell happy, and when Jonathan's happy, we're all happy, as you know, <laughs> but because we want to get to grips with sound doctrine so that we can swim in the deep end. 
And as you are reading, write up some kind of journal. So few Christians do that nowadays. Reading lots of Christian biography, all the great Christians from the past, they kept writing out in journals, this is what the Lord said to me today, this is what the Lord said to me today. We stopped doing that. Put into concrete words the truths that you are learning and make those truths yours. I mean, my head is like a sieve. We listen to and we read so much, but do we really meditate on and think about and make our own all these truths that God is giving us? Francis Bacon said, reading maketh a man full, speaking a man ready, writing a man exact. This isn't nursery school. This is the school of Christ and growing in our knowledge of the faith is hard work. Of course, growing in our knowledge of sound doctrine also means facing up to hard-hitting biblical truth that doesn't play well in our culture. Got to be brave about this. Tim Keller said, if we pick out which parts of the Bible we dislike, we actually have a God that we have created. We are idol worshipers. He said, how can that God ever call you out on anything? How can that God ever call you into anything either? Growing in our faith means accepting every word of Scripture as God's truth, whether we like it or not, whether it's popular or not, whether it gives us sleepless nights or not. We are called to love God with all our minds as well as our heart and soul. It matters what you believe, not just for yourself, but for others you are trying to teach. Learn to teach truth with exactitude to others. And as you are doing that, you will also be able to spot heresy when it raises its ugly head. It was frightening just a few years ago when Steve Chalk produced his controversial book, The Lost Message of Jesus. It was frightening not just that Chalk questioned core Bible doctrine, the fact that Christ died in our place at the cross. He questioned that. He questioned whether God poured out His wrath at human sin on Christ at the cross. But the really frightening thing was how few mainstream evangelicals didn't realize that this was heresy. A good friend of mine told me he went down to a debate in London on the whole issue of penal substitution, this idea that Christ took our place on the cross. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 3. This is core Christianity, that Christ died the death that we deserve to die for sin. That was what was up for grabs. But my friend told me he heard preachers who claimed to be evangelicals coming out in this discussion with the kind of things that liberals were coming out with a hundred years earlier. And today, of course, Steve Chalk, who started off as an evangelical minister, he dismisses orthodox views of the atonement and the reality of hell and any other kind of judgment. And he says recently, the Bible is inspiring, but it isn't inspired. And once you go down that road, then the rest of biblical truth comes tumbling down like a house of cards. What we believe is of eternal significance. So get stuck into sound doctrine and grow in your faith, the hard bits of the Bible as well as the nice bits. Martin Luther, who was taking on the whole world in the 1500s, Martin Luther famously said, peace if possible, truth at all costs. So truth comes ahead of peace. J.C. Ryle said, I am one of those old-fashioned ministers who believe the whole Bible and everything it contains. Is that old-fashioned? If it is, I'm old-fashioned. But of course, faith in the New Testament is more than just accepting a set of doctrines, however important that is. Kent Hughes differentiates between saving faith, the doctrine we believe, and practical faith, the way that doctrine transforms our lives. You remember Paul saying to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely, both things at the same time. Faith is a doing word as much as a believing word. That's the whole point of the epistle of James. 
Show me your faith by what you do. Hebrews 11, which we call the great chapter of faith, is not a set of doctrinal propositions. It's a chapter full of action. By faith, Abraham left Ur and went to the land that God showed him. By faith, Moses left the palaces of Egypt to suffer with the people of God. Faith begins with the doctrine we believe, but leads to an obedient Christian life where we're putting that doctrine into practice, or it's not faith at all. So we could put Hebrews chapter 11 into modern terms. By faith, Johnny started a Christianity Explored course in his office. By faith, Susan began a one-to-one Bible study with her next-door neighbor. By faith, Dave left his career in banking and went to Bible college, probably All Nations Bible College, to prepare for ministry. By faith, Eileen used her teaching skills to bring the gospel to children in Uganda. By faith, Kevin and his wife Sarah became home group leaders in their local church when no one else was willing to step up to the plate. By faith, Jenny started inviting moms that she met at the school gate home for coffee and developed conversations from there. By faith, Trinity Church began a new service in the local primary school. You see? Faith is a doing word. Faith prays and plans and invites and initiates and takes risks for the sake of the gospel. And Paul says to the Ephesians here that he never stopped giving thanks for their faith in the Lord Jesus. I'm sure he wasn't just talking about their doctrinal rectitude. He was talking about their active living in faith. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people were saying that about you today? I have heard about your faith. I have seen your faith in action, and I can't stop thanking God for it. Ask yourself this morning, am I growing in faith? Am I growing in my understanding and love of sound Christian doctrine on the one hand? And am I being transformed by that doctrine? Is my faith active, creative, and intentional? There's saving faith, and there's practical faith, and I need to be growing in both aspects. So Paul wanted to see a growing faith in these Ephesians. He also wanted to see a growing love. Verse 15, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. If you had to pick one of these virtues, faith, hope, or love, to flourish in, the New Testament leaves us in no doubt which one we should focus on. The greatest of these is, now we've really got to work on this interaction bit, the greatest of these is, thank you so much. The Christians borrowed a rarely used Greek word for love, agape, and they made it their own. Agape love is not sentimental. We are called to love those we may not like very much, even those who may have hurt us deeply. You remember Jesus' small group of disciples. He was kind of their home group leader, if you like. And that small group included Matthew, the tax collector, who was a collaborator with the Romans, and Simon the zealot, who carried a dagger up his sleeve to stab anyone who collaborated with the Romans. And those two men had to learn to love each other. Agape love is not sentimental, it is sacrificial, exemplified by Christ on a cross. I am called to lay down my life for others, whether they deserve that or not, whether I am naturally fond of them or not, whether they have been kind to me or just oblivious to me. Like Christ himself, after he had been butchered and nailed to a cross, so unjustly crying out, Father, forgive them, forgive these wretches, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's agape love. It is undeserved. And we need to dig deep for this treasure in the regular mess and madness of church life. How is your love life going right now? Who have you sacrificed yourself for recently? What are you doing to build bridges with the person who winds you up the most in church? We need God's grace to live this way. 
Notice in this verse, Paul gives thanks for the love of these Ephesian Christians. Ever since I heard of your faith and love, verse 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, it's clear from the second half of the letter that the love of these Ephesians was far from perfect. In fact, Paul has to talk to them quite sternly. Chapter 4, verse 2, he says, be humble and patient and bear with each other in love, presumably because they weren't doing that. Chapter 4, verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander. I wonder what a Sunday service looked like for the Ephesians, brawling and slander. I mean, clearly the Ephesians had a lot to learn about love, and yet Paul gives thanks here for every good thing he could see in them. And that's an indicator for us of how you can start loving that rather annoying brother who sings too loudly in church, or the sister who belittled your daughter last week. Pray for them through the same lens that Paul uses here. Look for things in them that you can praise God for. There's bound to be at least one thing. And ask God to bless them in some way. And as you do that, then the Holy Spirit goes to work in your heart to change your attitude towards them. Perhaps these people won't stop being difficult, but you start to look at them through the lens of Christ. You can learn to love others, even the awkward saints, by the grace God gives you. And doing that, learning to love like that, is the biggest sign that you are truly growing in your discipleship. Now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love and the greatest of these is love. So this is the first question we need to ask as we think about growing in the gospel. Are we growing in the fruits of the faith? Are we growing in active, doctrinally sound faith? And are we growing in sacrificial love? But Paul digs deeper here. And the second question this passage presents us with is, are you growing in spiritual insight? Are you growing in spiritual insight? That's verses 17 to 19. Verse 17 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. Now, let's remind ourselves that this whole letter of Ephesians is encouraging us to view the Christian life from the perspective of heavenly realms. That's where we get our spiritual insight from. If you view our lives purely on the physical level, on the material level, we would be in despair. The secularism of our nation, the sexual confusion of our day, the apostasy of the church, if you look from an earthly perspective, you would feel despair. But that is not where Paul wants us to look. He wants us to grow in spiritual insight. Specifically, he says, verse 17, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that we can grasp our glorious future in Christ. But how do we get this spirit of wisdom and revelation? You'll notice in your NIV that it's spirit with a capital S. This wisdom and revelation comes from the Holy Spirit, and we need to pray for God to give it to us. I was reading recently about the the powerful voices of blue whales. It's a very fishy sermon today, isn't it? Scientists have discovered that blue whales, who everyone thought were mute, actually have voices of immense power. The problem is we haven't been able to pick up their voices with our human ears because the voices operate at a frequency below what the human ear can hear. But scientists have developed instruments that enable them to pick up these whale calls. And apparently, the call of a blue whale launched from New York Harbor can be heard in Liverpool. Now, that's how powerful their voices are, but we were never previously aware of it until we got the right antennae to listen. 
There's a whole other world of spiritual reality out there, says Paul, just as there's a whole other world in ocean depths. And Paul says here we need to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who wants to fill us with the hope of glory amid the despair of this current age. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. As we dwell on these glorious truths of our future hope with prayerful contemplation, we can hear the Spirit's voice, a voice that is clear and captivating like the whale call across the Atlantic. Our future hope is so wonderful, it's so powerful, it reverberates across the whole of creation. In verse 18, Paul talks about the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. This glorious inheritance is nothing short of a new creation. You and I are immortal, and we are heading for a future where the whole created order will be transformed into a temple for God's glory, and we will reign at Christ's side in a new heavens and a new earth. And that fact remains true no matter the secularism sweeping the UK or how apostate the church has become. This hope remains vibrant and real. But we need to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who brooded over the first creation in Genesis 1 and now wants to fill us with joy and anticipation of the full glory of the new creation. But we've got to be still to do that, still to hear the Spirit's voice and dwell on these glorious truths. It's not easy to hear the Spirit's voice in the chaos of life. That's why Paul says in verse 17, I keep asking, keep asking that the eyes of your hearts will be enlightened. Because it's hard to see, it's hard to hear. We need to take real time in prayer and meditation on Scripture. I think that word meditation has become quite unpopular in evangelical circles because we think of you know, Hinduism and Buddhism and so on. Meditation is a biblical word. Psalm 1 says the godly man or woman meditates on the word of the Lord day and night. Those are the men and women who hear the Spirit's voice and grasp the enormity of the hope of glory. And Paul said to the Corinthians, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. It's an intentional state of mind. We fix our eyes, aphareo in the Greek, which means literally to look away to. We deliberately look away to. The Spirit has given us a new set of lenses so that we can live in the mess of today filled with the glorious hope of tomorrow. While we live in a feeling of despair in this age and we want to build the kingdom in the the midst of the despair, it's not that we're constantly looking away, not thinking about real life. Of course, we're thinking about real life. We're surrounded by it. We're building the kingdom in the mess. But as we do that, at the same time, we need to deliberately and intentionally look away to the hope of glory all the time. I keep asking, says Paul, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know, that you can see, that you can feel how glorious your hope is, how wonderful your inheritance, how rich your destiny. And that's the thing that helps us persevere today with joy and gratitude. So Paul is passionate here that we are growing in spiritual insight. He asked in this prayer, not only that we will see our hope for what it truly is, but that we will see God's power for what it truly is. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Verse 19, and what? And his God's incomparably great power for us who believe. And so we need this wisdom and revelation that comes from the Spirit so that we can fully grasp our future hope and so that we can appreciate how powerful God really is. And Paul gathers together here as many words for power as he can muster. Verse 20, that power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. 
Now, our NIV translations use the words power, might, exerted, but they don't quite do full justice to what the Greek's saying here. Clint Arnold says, Paul nearly exhausts the reservoir of power denoting terms in the Greek language. The Greek uses four separate words for power in verses 19 to 20, which include the ideas of energy, strength, might, alongside the classic Greek word for power, dunamis, from where we eventually got the word dynamite. These power words appeared regularly in the Jewish literature of Paul's day, but always in the context of magical incantations. But Paul's not talking about magic here. In fact, you might remember that when he went to Ephesus, he got new converts to burn their magic books, get rid of your incantations. Paul is saying here, we have direct access to God's limitless power, might, strength, and energy, and we just need to ask for it. We don't need magical incantations. It's extraordinary for a man in a prison cell. It is amazing how much Paul believed in the limitless power of God. Do you believe in the limitless power of God? Do you believe in God's incomparably great power? not just in the past, but today. Living in a secular nation can squeeze the limits of our expectation of God, but Paul wants to blow those expectations wide open with a phrase like, incomparably great power. He's not being subtle here. A.W. Tozer said, one of my favorite quotes, A.W. Tozer said, anything God has ever done, He can do today. Anything God has ever done anywhere, He can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, He can do for you. Brothers and sisters, the God we worship can open the waters of the sea. He can shut the mouths of lions. He gives Saturn its rings and a newborn baby its DNA. And in chapter 3, Paul goes on to say, He can do more than all we ask or imagine. I can imagine quite a bit. Do you believe this morning in a God of incomparably great power? Because that's what the view looks like from heavenly realms. God sent revivals in the past when the church was at its lowest ebb. I was a pastor in Cardiff back in 2004 when they were celebrating 100 years of the Welsh revival. That 1904 revival really began back in 1902 when some older Welsh saints were concerned about the lack of young people in Welsh chapels. And so they started praying. And they did it in little cottage prayer meetings, the most unspectacular thing you could find. Reports of those prayer meetings said they were dull as dishwater to begin with, lots of quiet. But as these dear faithful saints kept praying, they then grew an expectation of what God could do. And then in 1904, the dams burst. The Spirit came in fresh power, and the fear of God fell on an entire nation. God raised up a young man called Evan Roberts, who had no theological education. Actually, all the theologians were missed out by the revival. But this young man had an insatiable hunger for God. And this 26-year-old son of a miner began to preach with such power that he went across the whole nation of Wales for a year, and he saw 100,000 converts to Christ. You can look back in the archives of local Welsh newspapers giving accounts of chapels being filled until three o'clock in the morning with young people crying out to God for mercy. When the Spirit fell, people became deeply aware of their sin. They weren't laughing about it. They became deeply aware of their sin. The fear of God fell on them. Dance halls emptied. Police stations were closed because there was no crime. And policemen became part of local church choirs. Hardened miners were lowered into their pits singing hymns like, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Can you imagine Welsh voices singing that down a pit? And that revival came when the nation was at its lowest ebb spiritually, and older saints began to pray to a God of incomparably great power. Brothers and sisters, will you pray that God will move His hand in this nation again? The Keswick Convention has been instrumental in revivals in the past, but I don't want to talk about the power of God in the past tense. Anything God has ever done, He can do today. 
Anything God has ever done anywhere, he can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. Believe it, live it, pray it. And we might just see the sovereign Lord doing glorious things in a nation that has walked away from him. We need to renew our conviction in the power of God. Isn't it true that God often works to the level of our expectations of him? If Paul could have these massive expectations of God from a Roman prison cell, we can certainly have those expectations in a place like Keswick. And wouldn't it be wonderful if a prayer movement began from this convention that would move God's hand and make the demons tremble? This isn't something you can manipulate, but it is something we should be longing for, should we not? Let's not be afraid to talk about revival. And of course, it's not just about nationwide revivals, but it's praying for power from God to break the chains of sins and addictions that are making the church powerless right now. The chains of pornography. Teenagers, 20-year-olds with iPhones now who love Jesus in their hearts, but they've watched so much stuff, they think they can't serve Jesus anymore. Pray that the chains of pornography will be broken the chains that come with wealth and desire for personal comfort. Ask yourself right now, as the cost of living rises and rises and we're becoming poorer and poorer, is that better for the church or worse? Which do you think? Thank you, sister. The chains of fear when it comes to witnessing for Christ. Will we open our mouths for Jesus? 2 Corinthians 4 says we present the truth of Christ plainly to men and women. We need to pray for power at work in our evangelism. We need to speak plainly of Christ who bore the wrath of God and paid the price for sin to rescue us from hell. Where did the H word go from our churches? Before Christ rose again from the dead and is gloriously victorious, we tell the message as it is, not relying on rhetoric or even reasonableness or, or smoke coming out from big stages. The gospel is not reasonable and never has been in the eyes of men and women who are utterly lost. It is not acceptable in a fallen world. But the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of men, women, and children. And we depend totally on the Spirit's power, the Spirit's might, the Spirit's energy, the Spirit's strength to open blind eyes as we present the gospel plainly. Let's begin to see reality from the perspective of heavenly realms. Let's repent as a church of our limited vision of God. And let's believe once again in a God of immeasurably great power and his mighty workings in Christ. And let's clean up our lives, get rid of our idols, so that we are pure vessels praying to a Father who wants his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven have sky-high expectations of God. That's what truly honors him. As Ephesians 3 says, to him who is able to do more than all we ask or imagine. If that's not the God you're worshiping, you're worshiping an idol. So this passage is making us ask questions that analyze how much we are truly growing in the gospel. Number one, are we growing in the fruits of the faith? Faith, hope, and love. Number two, are we growing in spiritual insight so that we can see our spiritual inheritance, the glorious inheritance is coming, and so that we can grasp God's incomparably great power? And number three, are you growing in appreciation of Christ? Are you growing in appreciation of Christ? That's verses 20 to 23. So you remember Ephesians opened with Paul outlining God's plan to bring everything together under Christ at the end of the ages. The future is Christ. All God's plans are bound up in Christ. Are you growing in appreciation of him? That's where God wants you to be by his spirit. Do we realize how great Jesus Christ really is and what his work of redemption has accomplished? Paul says here that God has demonstrated his incomparably great power in one particular act the resurrection and ascension of Christ. That's the most powerful thing God has ever done. Verse 20, the power that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. 
to be seated at the right hand of God was to be placed in the seat of power over the whole universe. And Christ is seated at God's right hand because the work of redemption is complete. You'll remember in the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, there was no seat for the high priest to sit on because his work of offering sacrifices was never finished. But Christ, our great high priest, can now sit down because his work of redemption is done. And his resurrection from the dead is sufficient to renew the entire cosmic order. That is the power of Christ's resurrection. Paul points to the the resurrection here as the key example of God's incomparably great power. Do you realize how powerful the resurrection is? Not just for your life and your future, but for the whole of creation. The resurrection means not just that we will rise as individual believers united to Christ in glorified bodies that we can scarcely imagine. We will rise from our graves to be with the Lord on the last day. Hallelujah. But his resurrection has the power to renew the entire cosmos. When the stone was rolled away, an entirely new creation project began. And Christ will rule over a new heavens and a new earth. And Paul says in Romans 8, all of creation is longing for the glory of the sons and daughters of God because at that moment when we are glorified, the whole of creation will be renewed by the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That's our future. And as Paul thinks of the position and the status of Jesus Christ, the risen, ascended ruler over the world to come, he wants to emphasize Christ's unrivaled name. Verse 21, Christ has been raised far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked. So Paul adds up all the authority figures you could ever think of here, every name you could possibly think of who has any level of power in this universe angelic and demonic powers, world government powers, and whatever other powers that exist that haven't been revealed to us yet. Christ's name, his status and authority are not just above any other authority in the universe, but far above them in this current age, even though it's unseen by us, and in the age to come. Our appreciation for Christ expands all the more when you realize that you're going to share in Christ's limitless rule in the world to come. The wonderful thing about Christ's exaltation is that you and I are intimately connected to Him. Jesus' future is our future. Jesus is seated in heavenly realms right now, Ephesians 2, 5, and we have been seated with Him in heavenly realms. We share His victory today. We share in His glory, His status, His power and authority. Our future glory is secure because He is the author of that destiny. And the more we look at Him, the more we see our own destiny light up before our eyes. Murray McShane said, for every one look at yourself, take ten looks at Jesus Christ. My future is as secure as Jesus Himself. If Jesus goes under, then so do we. But Paul tells us that we can be confident in the supremacy of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the world, Lord of all, invisibly in the present, but publicly and dramatically in the future. No one can stand against God's plans for us because Christ has the name that is above every name. I'm sure Philippians 2 is coming to your minds now. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Are you growing in your appreciation of Christ. His destiny is our destiny. We are irrevocably joined to Him now. That's why Paul used the phrase, in Christ, nine times in the first 14 verses. In fact, this phrase, in Christ, is used 26 times in Ephesians. And in Christ is actually the most common definition for a Christian. The word Christian is used about, I think, once in the New Testament. In Christ is used over 150 times. We shouldn't really call each other Christians. We should call each other in Christ once. Our futures are inextricably bound with His. I don't know if you you remember the the three-legged race that you did at school. I've got particularly bad memories of that, I have to say, because I was always tall and the other, anyway. But we are in a kind of spiritual three-legged race, and we're holding on to Christ. He's holding on to us, and He's going to take us all the way. That is us and Jesus. 
Verse 22, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The supremacy of Christ is astonishing in itself, but the fact that he uses his supremacy for our good and future glory is thrilling and humbling in equal measure. The death he died, the power of his resurrection, the exaltation to the right hand of God, his future coming in glory to renew the cosmos and reign over heaven and earth, all of that is for the church. Perhaps the most basic definition of a Christian is, I love Jesus because he died for my sins, which is wonderfully true, but the gospel is so much bigger than that. Christ came from heaven for me. He was born of a virgin for me. He became the man of sorrows for me. He was crucified, buried, and risen again to new life for me. He ascended to the right hand of God for me, and he will come in power and glory for me, and he will invite me to reign at his side in the future world. He did all this for me, for us, for the church. How precious we are in the sight of God. As Charles Wesley's great hymn put it, Jesus and all in him is mine. And so, I put it to you, the clearest sign that you and I are growing in appreciation of Christ is that we are giving ourselves to him just as he has given himself for us. The church, says Paul here, is his body, and Jesus laid his body on the line to save us. Will we lay our bodies on the line for him? As Isaac Watts' beautiful hymn says, love so amazing, so divine, demands, cries out for my soul, my life, my all. What is Jesus Christ worth to you? That's the question at the heart of all true discipleship. Stop paddling in the pool of faith. Swim in the ocean. Keep growing in the gospel of God's Son. Like a shark emerging out of its small tank and reaching its full potential in the wild seas. By God's grace, let's grow in the fruits of the faith, faith, hope, and love. Let's grow in spiritual insight so that we grasp our future hope for what it is, and we learn to believe once more in God's incomparably great power. And let's grow in our appreciation of the Lord Jesus Christ until He comes to gather us to Himself and fill the cosmos with His glory. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray now for us, and the band's going to come up. We're going we're to close by singing when I survey. Let's just think now what God's been saying to me today, and what am I going to do about it? Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious gospel that you have given us. Thank you for your Son whom you sent from heaven. Thank you that he gave up his life as a ransom for us. He bought us with his blood. And as we think of his glorious condescension, coming down to death, even death on a cross, Father, help us to be ready to die with him. And thank you, Father, that you have now exalted him to the highest place. And you have given him the name that is above every name, that out of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you that as we share in his death, as we sacrifice our lives for one another, for the church, to reach others with the gospel, as we sacrifice ourselves, we are dying with him. And we await the day when you will come, Jesus himself will come personally, and the great resurrection will happen. We will be raised in glory to reign with him forever. Love so amazing, so divine, 
demands my soul, my life, my all. Help us to live it for Jesus' glory. Amen. Let's stand together.
that amazing love in Jesus rests upon us. But perhaps this morning at the close of this meeting, what you've heard, what you've considered in your own life, through what has been said or more widely, is something you would like to pray through with someone. Our prayer team are available to pray with you after this service. If you want to pray with someone, please move to the right at the front here. Our prayer team will be there. Perhaps it's those constraints in your environment, that constraint on growing in Christ. You want someone to pray with you for a changed attitude in yourself towards it, for God's power to hold, to lead, to help you. Our prayer team will be there to pray with you. If you're watching online or at home and you'd like someone to pray for you here, then please spend, send a specific prayer request to prayer at keswickministries.org and we will be pleased and honored to pray for you. And remember our prayer meeting tomorrow morning, quarter to nine, over in base camp in PH1. As we stand now, let's pray and close before the Lord together. Keep us this day looking to Jesus, Heavenly Father. Please give us grateful appreciation to him. Thank you that by faith in his work, we are joined with him. Please go with us into this day, this afternoon, this evening. And please keep binding us together, not only in the gospel, not only in one another, but with your son, Jesus, that that gospel points to, with rejoicing and with gratitude. Amen.